Hi everyone, my name is Louise Kaepner and I'm a research associate at the UK Data Service. Just want to start by saying thank you for attending this webinar, which is part two in our machine learning series. Okay, so first we're going to start with a small recap of last week's session. We'll be talking about just the differences between supervised and unsupervised learning. Then I'll introduce clustering and what it is. I'm also going to cover why it's useful and why it is that you should care about it. Then we'll discuss some different types of clustering algorithms. And finally, we'll cover the k-means algorithm and hierarchical clustering. So for those of you that attended our first machine learning talk, you might remember that we spoke about the different types of machine learning algorithms. These algorithms generally fall into two main categories. We have supervised learning and unsupervised learning. There is also something called semi-supervised learning and also something called reinforcement learning, but we're not going to be focusing on these today. So the table just shows you that brief recap. You've got the differences here. So supervised learning, input data is often labeled. Unsupervised learning, it's often unlabeled. Um, I will be putting these slides up at the end, so you can go back and just have a look at this table if you want to refresh yourself. But to illustrate the differences between supervised and unsupervised learning, I'm going to draw on the infamous Iris Flower data set. And this is widely used as a beginner data set for machine learning, as it's freely available online. So this data set, shown in the top table, contains a collection of labeled iris flowers. So you can see we have the attributes, we've got sepal length, petal length, petal width, and we've got the species of flower. So our data points A to F each represent a flower. So let's say that we want to predict each flower species based on their attributes. So that's the sepal length, petal length, and petal width. Now to do this, I could create a supervised learning model, which uses a training data set that includes my independent variables. So that's the attributes that I've just mentioned and my outcome variable, which is the species that I wish to predict. Once I've trained my model with this data, I'd then be able to make predictions about the species of iris flower with unseen data points. So you can see with this data set, I have a new data point F, which is shown on the green row. I can now use the information that's been supplied about the independent variables to assign this data point to a class. Whereas clustering algorithms that we'll be focusing on today, they're unsupervised. So that means that I only have input variables. So you can see in the second table, I have sepal length, petal length, and petal width, but I have no corresponding output variable. My data points A to E are unlabeled, so we don't know which species our data points belong to. Therefore, our purpose in implementing a clustering algorithm is going to be different. Instead of using it to predict specific species, we can use it to model the underlying pattern and distribution of the data. So we can predict the optimum number of clusters and then represent them visually. So we might end up with a result like the 3D graph on the right, which groups the data points into three distinct clusters. That's one for each species of iris flower. So what is clustering then? Clustering is the task of partitioning a data set into groups called clusters. The goal is to split up the data in such a way that points within a single cluster are very similar and points in different clusters are different. So the output of clustering algorithms is going to be this extra column here, which we've labeled cluster, where you can see that each data point, so that's A to E, has been assigned to a cluster. So why bother with it? Well, clustering algorithms appeal to data scientists for a number of reasons. First and most importantly, as I've said, clustering can tell us about the underlying structure of the data, and that can be really useful in highlighting patterns and identifying groups of similar objects. And by revealing the underlying structure of the data, that also allows us to identify possible outliers in our clusters. This can be done by calculating the distance of each data point from its center and then defining our most distant points as outliers. So that's shown in the image on the right. So you can see the green points um, are a little bit further away um, and they've been identified as outliers. What we can do then is get rid of these data points so that they don't you know, distort our results or impede our statistical analysis. Finally, 
Clustering is also useful for something called image compression. And that's a type of data compression that's applied to digital images. So when we compress images, this is really useful because it takes up less storage space on a device. And clustering works with this by, it clusters similar colors together and in doing so, reduces the number of colors on the image. So we have something called lossless compression, which is a method used to reduce the size of a file whilst maintaining the same quality as before it was compressed. But there's also something called lossy compression, and that compresses a photo to an even smaller size, but in doing so, discards some parts of the photo. So on the right, you can see we have um, an image which shows the result of lossy image compression on an image of a parrot. As you can see, we haven't lost a great amount of detail, and that's why this method is really useful for data scientists. So let's look at some other use cases. So one of its most popular applications involves the world of marketing and sales. Clustering is often used to group customers according to what they've bought. So purchase information and customer traits are used to develop recommendation systems. So you'll often see suggestions when you're using sites like Amazon, which say something along the lines of, people who've bought X also bought Y. You can see the example in the picture shows how we can collect customer purchase data to identify a cluster of books that are popular with a certain audience. So then when we have an individual that buys two particular books, so let's say these books are Harry Potter and The Hunger Games, what we can do is we can then recommend them a third book, which might be Lord of the Rings, based on what other customers like that individual have bought. We do also have less sort of capitalist applications. So scientists will often use clustering methods to group genetically similar viruses together. And that can be helpful in improving our knowledge of certain viruses like COVID-19. Successful attempts have also been made to counter the spread of fake news online with articles that have a high percentage of certain terms being deemed to have a higher probability of being fake or misleading. So we could have one cluster for words or terms that are associated with fake news and another cluster for words or terms that are associated with true articles. And of course, we have um, the more frivolous and fun uses of, as well. So you can see the second image shows the result of clustering on a Pokemon data set. And we've got Pokemon grouped according to their attributes. So here we have three clusters, including the coolest Pokemon. So we've got Squirtle wearing his shades, um, cutest Pokemon, which includes uh, Togepi and Piplup. And we also have the pretty unfairly named grossest Pokemon, which includes Pokemon with poorly inspired designs, such as Klefki, which is pretty much just a bunch of keys. Um, so yeah, you can see there's a lot of use cases uh, for clustering. But what is a cluster? So what are these groups that we're trying to search for in our data sets? So here I have a, good, a really good quote which states, there's no universal definition of what a cluster is. It's really gonna depend on the context and different algorithms will capture different kinds of clusters. So yeah, it's really important to state that these clusters or groups they don't actually exist out there in the world. They exist based on how we interact with the data. So you can think about a box of Lego, for instance. There's many ways that we could divide this box of Lego. Maybe we could split it into two clusters based on the size of the pieces. So we could have large pieces and small pieces. Or we could split this box into five or six clusters, depending on the color of each piece. Or even 50 clusters if you know we wanted to group pieces based on how they work for a certain kind of build. As you can see, it all depends on the context and the criteria that we specify. However, there will be times when you know a bit more about the clusters you want to produce. So perhaps you're working with clustering individuals by their gender. In that case, you're going to expect that there's going to be at least two clusters. Right, so let's talk a bit about the types of clustering algorithms. So how useful these different algorithms are going to be, again, depends on the context and also the nature of the problem that you're trying to solve. So first up, we have something called centroid based clustering, and that works by assigning each data point to a number of centroids to form groups or clusters. These algorithms, like the k-means algorithm, 
are efficient, effective, and they're pretty simple to implement as well. But uh, they do have the downside of being uh, pretty sensitive to initial conditions and outliers. We also have something called density-based clustering, and that works by separating high-density regions of data points from low-density areas. Unlike centroid-based clustering, there's no need to be sensitive about initial conditions, so we don't have to pick the number of clusters that we want beforehand. And also these algorithms don't assign outliers to clusters, which is really helpful. But they do struggle to perform well with data of varying densities and data of high dimensions. We also have something called distribution-based clustering, and that contrasts with our two previous examples. So centroid-based clustering is based on proximity, so some measure of distance. And density-based clustering is based on composition, so density. Whereas distribution-based clustering, it takes probability into consideration. So data, data points are grouped together based on their likelihood of belonging to the same probability distribution. So that could be Gaussian or binomial. The advantage that these algorithms have over the centroid-based algorithms is their ability to model diversely sized clusters. So you can see in the picture, we've got like um, these three clusters of different sizes, and it works quite well with that. But the downside is that these algorithms tend to only work well with synthetic data or with data points that belong to a predefined distribution. Finally, we also have hierarchical clustering, which like centroid-based clustering, it's based on proximity with the idea being that each object or data point is connected to its neighbors depending on the distance. And it works by creating a tree of clusters which are represented as dendrograms. These models are better than centroid-based algorithms when it comes to dealing with non-convex clusters. And we don't have to initialize or set the number of clusters beforehand. However, these algorithms can be slow and they often don't perform well on larger data sets. So understandably, that's a lot of information to take in. Um, I don't expect you to understand it all now, and we will be going through centroid-based and hierarchical in a bit more depth. But you might be wondering how it is that you decide on a type of algorithm. And my main advice that you know I really can't stress enough is to explore your data first. This will help you sort of weed out the less suitable algorithms. So you might want to determine for instance, if your data falls into a predefined distribution. If it doesn't, well, that's going to rule out your distribution-based algorithms. Or maybe you're working with a pretty large data set, in which case you might want to avoid using hierarchical clustering. But I do also recommend, you know, just trying out a few uh, different types as well. There's loads of great machine learning programming packages, and um, they're all like made to be pretty easy to implement. So you could try out these different types of algorithms and you know compare the results. But for now, we're going to take a bit of a closer look at centroid based, a centroid-based algorithm called the k-means algorithm. Then I'm going to go on to talk a bit about hierarchical clustering. Right, so how does the k-means algorithm work? The first thing that we do is we start with our collection of data points. So that's our input data, which is shown in the first image. And our goal is to separate them into k clusters. So the letter k denotes the number of clusters. And in this case, we have chosen k to equal three. Then we start the process of finding clusters by selecting three random data points. These points are now gonna act as centroids or the center of the clusters that we're going to make. So in the second picture, you can see that we have randomly selected three initialization points and they're represented by these different color triangles. Then we assign each data point to its nearest centroid. You can see we've done that here in the third picture. And to do that, we use a distance measure. In the case of the K-means algorithm, we use something called the Euclidean distance. We do that to calculate the distance from each point to its nearest cluster. So yeah, you can see that we've assigned our points here and now each point has a color. So once we've assigned all of our points and we have three clusters, we find the actual centroids that are formed by each of them. To do this, we move each 
um, initialization point to the mean of the data points that were assigned to it. So if you look at the fourth picture, you can see that the triangles have moved a bit. So we can see that the, um, you know, the red triangle has moved quite a bit, the green one not so much, and the blue one's also moved quite a bit. So then the process is repeated. So based on our new centroids, which are shown in this picture here, picture four, we reassign each data point to its nearest cluster. Then we recompute the centroids. So when we recompute our centroids again in picture six, we can see that our triangles are now pretty well placed in the center of each cluster. So you can see um, the triangles are quite near the center of each of our data points. Then the process continues until the assignment of data points to centroids remains unchanged. So we continue doing this until the centroids are no longer being moved. And at this point, the algorithm stops as we've, as we've reached convergence. And you can see that we have three clearly defined clusters of red, blue, and green data points. So yeah, you can see that here, it's all pretty well clustered. So in terms of how we evaluate the quality of the cluster assignments, we do this by computing something called the sum of the squared error after the centroids converge. And the aim of the algorithm is gonna to be to minimize that error so that we have good quality clusters. But the key to finding good clustering solutions with the k-means algorithm is that you're gonna to have to run it multiple times with different random initialization points. In this example here, our algorithm managed to find a good solution pretty quickly. So, you, you know, it only took a few runs and we only recomputed our centroids three times. However, that isn't always the case. Because our initialization points are chosen at random, this can produce different results on successive runs. That's why it's really important that you run the algorithm multiple times with different random initialization points. And then you can compare to look at the sum of squared error. So you might find you've got the best run on a, one of these runs. Another thing that I want to briefly introduce is something called pseudocode. Some of you might already be familiar with this concept, but I do expect that we've probably got a lot of beginners that are wondering what this is. So as we know, we use a programming language to implement machine learning algorithms. And you can think of pseudocode as a sort of recipe that you'll follow and you, you'll execute in a given programming language. When we write pseudocode, we use structural conventions of a normal programming language, but in a way that makes an algorithm concise and digestible. So what I'm gonna do is just briefly show you how you can go from writing a sort of basic to-do list to translating that into pseudocode and then write in actual code. So yeah, I might whiz through these slides a bit um, as I don't wanna to get too sort of caught up on this. So yeah, here you have um, step one. So I call this sort of like pseudo English. Um, all of you know um, how to write a to-do list. So yeah, you can just basically start off by writing a very simple numbered list of what you want the algorithm to do and what it is that it should be doing. So when you've got this, you can then start to think about how to translate that into your pseudocode. A good, a good first step in that translation process might be defining um, our input and output. So you can see that we have our input P, which is our set of data points, and our expected output, which will be our K clusters. And you'll notice as well that we have some mathematical notation and programming syntax here. You can see that we've sketched out where our while loops and for loops will be. And we've also indented these to mark where the loops will be. And that's going to make it easier for us to take the next step and translate that into code. Um, yeah, but don't worry if that looks crazy to you. I really don't expect anyone to be familiar with what a for loop is or what a while loop is, but this is just to highlight how we can go from pseudo English to pseudo code. Finally, you have your step three, and that's where we translate our pseudo code into actual code. And to do this, we use our pseudocode, which acts as a guide that we can follow throughout. And that's gonna make the whole process of writing code much easier. So yeah, that was just a little detour, but uh, now let's get back to the k-means algorithm and answer some of the sort of pressing questions around it. So I mentioned uh, previously that the second step in the algorithm is the initialization process 
And that's where we select our K initialization points and therefore our number of presumed centroids. There are many different ways that we can approach this initialization process. And it is worth being a bit strategic about how we choose these initial points, as ultimately the results of our K means are really going to depend upon this initialization. If we think about how the uh, about the algorithm and how it works, we have this two step iterative process where we repeatedly recompute our centroid and reassign our data points. But how many iterations that it takes for the algorithm to converge is going to largely depend on the placement of the initial centroids. So if we can optimally position these presumed centroids, we're going to end up with a more efficient algorithm. So I've just outlined a few different approaches here. Firstly, we have the traditional approach, which is known as Borghi's method, I think. Um, and that involves selecting k random data points from the data set. So this is notable for being a pretty fast initialization method, and it has the advantage of making it more likely that we'll get a centroid that lies close to the modes of our data set. There is also something called the random partition method. So in for this method, we randomly assign data points to a cluster, and then we calculate the mean of each cluster to get the initial centroids. So um, this tends to produce centroids which are close to the mean of the data, but it doesn't work particularly well with the k-means algorithm. If initialized using this method, the k-means is more likely to get stuck in something called a local minimum. And that's just a fancy way of saying that it doesn't find the best solution. So we also have, um, moving away from, you know, sort of the different k-means methods, there's something called the k-means plus plus algorithm. And that uses a more strategic approach towards central initialization. Um, what happens is we randomly assign the first centroid to a data point, and then we carefully choose the remaining centroids based on the maximum squared distance. So that's going to mean that the centroids are as far as possible from one another, which is, you know, it's going to mean fewer iterations. And generally, this tends to work better than Fourier's method, and of course, um, much better than the random partition method. So we figured out how it is that we're going to initialize our centroids. But how do we know how many centroids we need? You know, i.e., how do we know how many clusters we want? So this is where we determine uh, what k should equal. Of course, from having seen the unla the uh, labeled sorry iris data set, we know that there are three species of iris that we want to uncover. But you'll be using clustering on unlabeled data, so you won't know the number of groups that are hidden in the data. Therefore, to find this optimal number, we can use something called the elbow approach or the elbow method, which involves running the k-means algorithm with a range of different k-values, say from 1 to 10. Then what you do is you plot the performance metric, so that's the sum of squared error that I mentioned before, and you plot this for each k. So you can see we've got this elbow plot here on the left at the bottom. So the goal of the algorithm, like I've said, is to minimize the error. But what you'll notice is that each time we increase the number of clusters, the sum of squared error decreases. And that makes sense, right? So if you think about it, as more centroids are added, the distance from each point to its closest centroid is going to decrease because there's, you know, a bunch of centroids everywhere. And the sum of squared error is going to be zero when k is equal to the number of data points in the data set because then each data point is essentially its own cluster and there's no error between it and the center of its cluster. So the goal of the elbow method is not to find the lowest sum of squared error, but it's to find the point when adding more clusters no longer provides a significant decrease in the sum of squared error. So as you can see, at first, we have this very rapid decrease in the sum of squared error, and that levels out after k equals three, where there's a bend. And that's also known as the elbow point. After this bend, we can see a very slow and gradual decrease in the error. So it starts decreasing in a more linear fashion. So k equals 3 is going to be our elbow. And that indicates that 3 is the best number of clusters that we can find for this data set. 
But it should be noted that the ELBA method is not the only method available for choosing the best number of clusters, and nor is it the best method. So it can have like a pretty hard time determining the optimal k value when there's more clusters. Sorry, let me read that again. So it can have a hard time determining the optimal k value when there are clusters that are relatively close to one another. So a, a solution to this and a more precise approach is to use something called the silhouette score. What the silhouette score does is it measures how close a point in one cluster is to points in the neighboring clusters. So we've got an example of a silhouette plot and that's shown on the right. I'm not gonna go into that um, now in too much detail just because you know this is only an introduction and I don't wanna overwhelm everyone. But the main thing is that we have these different methods that can help us pick our k-value. So let's cover a few of the strengths of the k-means algorithm. The main strength of it is that it's very simple to implement, which is the reason why I chose it as one of my first um, clustering examples. It's also fast and it's scalable too, which means that it works well with large data sets. And that's due to its simple iterative nature. So remember, uh, that's those two repetitive steps where we you know, continuously recompute our centers and then reassign our points. So it's very simple to apply this to a larger data set. But there are, of course, some limitations that are worth discussing. So as we just covered in the previous uh, slide before the last, this algorithm requires a bit of manual work. So, you know, you're going to have to select the K value and you've also got your different centroid initialization methods to consider. So that's um you know, Forgue's method or the random partition method. Also, the results of our k-means will depend largely upon the initial centroid values, as I've said. And we must run the algorithm several times to avoid suboptimal solutions. So this image here shows what happens when k-means converges to a local minimum and therefore produces counterintuitive results. Because the initial configuration places the pink and brown centroid quite close together, what happens is after five, in iterate, after five iterations, sorry, they converge to a suboptimal solution. So you can see here at the end, we don't have a sort of like, you know, logical um, clustering solution here. And that's why the centroid initialization method matters. If we initialize uh, this algorithm with a more, you know, sophisticated initialization method, we'd expect to see a better result that better fits the obvious cluster structure of this data set. Finally, the k-means can fail in cases where the data is of varying sizes and also varying densities, or if it's non-spherical. So the first image on the right at the bottom shows some data which is densely packed in the blue and red cluster but we can see that there's outliers that have been wrongly assigned to each of these clusters. And that's because the k-means algorithm defines clusters by diameter only. Because clusters are circular, there's also no way for k-means to account for direction, which is why it performed poorly in clustering the data in the second image as well. And it's also why it performs badly in the final image too, because it doesn't let data points that are far away from each other share the same cluster, even though, as we can see, they obviously do belong to the same cluster. So yeah, there are limitations to this method as well. But um, we're gonna move on now to hierarchical clustering. What is hierarchical clustering? Um, how does it differ to our k-means algorithm? So let's start with the quote from Reddy and Vinzamori. And they state that hierarchical clustering algorithms approach the problem of clustering by developing a binary tree-based data structure, and that's called the dendrogram. Once the dendrogram is constructed, one can automatically choose the right number of clusters by splitting the tree at different levels. And when you do that, you obtain different clustering solutions for the same data set without having to rerun the clustering algorithm again. So as you can see, I've highlighted two parts of the quote that are pretty important when it comes to sort of understanding the difference between k-means and hierarchical clustering. So k-means requires us to specify how many clusters we want in advance, whereas hierarchical clustering, it builds these clusters iteratively 
So it links already existing clusters that are similar into larger clusters. Once the dendrogram is constructed, we can then slice it horizontally according to how many clusters we want. So in a sense, we have a bit more freedom with this. You know, we're not having to pick what k equals before we, you know, run the algorithm. On the right, we have the output of hierarchical clustering, which describes the relationship between different primates. So we can see that humans are closely related to uh, the great apes like the chimpanzee and the gorilla. So that's one cluster there. But we can see that we also have another cluster, which includes old world monkeys that differ to apes in some ways, with the main difference being that they have a tail. And if we continued with this example, we could zoom out more and then talk about primates as a, as a cluster, and then mammals and so on and so on. And if you look at the second picture, we can see that we do have this even more zoomed out dendrogram, which describes the relationship among uh, different groups of animals. But we're gonna talk about these dendrograms in a bit more depth now. And we're gonna talk about how it is that you read one. So we're gonna start with a very simple example. So on the left, we have our scatter plot of six random data points, A, B, C, D, and E. And on the right is our dendrogram, which is the output of hierarchical clustering. So the main thing that you want to focus on when you read in a dendrogram is the y-axis or the height. And that denotes the measure of distance or similarity between either individual data points or clusters. So in this case, Similarity between objects is judged purely by their geographic X and Y positions. So objects are most similar when they are geographically close to one another. Here we can see that A and B are most similar because the height of the link that joins them together is the smallest. And that's reflected in the scatter plot, right? Whilst the next two most similar objects are D and E. And we can see here that are pretty close together as well. In the second image, you can see that we've sliced the, de the dendrogram horizontally with this blue dotted line, so that all the resulting child branches that are formed below the core represent an, an individual cluster. So in this case, we have two main clusters. And in terms of the similarity between clusters, we can see that the main difference between them is between the cluster of C, A and B versus that of D and E. As the height of the link that joins them is the highest. We could also perform another slice, which we've done with the orange dotted line, so that we have three clusters. In this case, we'd have A and B as one cluster, C as the next, and D and E as the final cluster. And you can see how we get that because this horizontal uh, split is going through three of these branches here. So let's move on to the two main approaches to hierarchical clustering. So there's two main strategies for how you build your hierarchy of clusters. We've got agglomerative and divisive. So agglomerative clustering is a bottom-up approach where we consider each observation to be its own cluster. And then what we do is we merge the two most similar clusters and so on until we have one big cluster. So you can see at the bottom, we have this big cluster now. Whereas divisive clustering is a top-down approach. And that's essentially the opposite of the agglomerative approach. So instead, we start with our observations in one big cluster. And at each step, we split a cluster until each cluster contains only one observation. So yeah, I'm not going to linger on that slide for too long. Um, the slides are going to be up, so you can always go back and refresh yourself on this. Um, but this is just, you know, talking about how we build that hierarchy. But then how do we know which clusters should be combined in the case of agglomerative clustering? Or how do we know which ones are to be split in the case of divisive? The first ingredient necessary for either type of hierarchical clustering algorithm is going to be a measure of distance. Like our k-means algorithm, hierarchical clustering is proximity based. So we're going to need some measure of similarity between pairs of observations. And the choice of distance measure is an important step because it defines how the similarity of two elements or data points is calculated. And therefore, it's going to affect the shape of the clusters. The default distance measure is the Euclidean distance, which we came across in the k-means algorithm. 
you'll remember in the previous example the similarity is based purely on the x and y positions of our six data points so that's for this one right um, similarity was based on their geographic position for a basic geographic clustering like this the euclidean distance is a simple and suitable distance measure to use so i've put the formula for the euclidean distance on the right and an example as well so you can revisit this slide if you need to in a future date just to get to grips with um, what it is and how it works mathematically once we compute the distance between every pair of observations we end up with a distance matrix but depending on the type of data and the researcher questions other similarity measures may be preferred so there's other ways that we can go about building this distance matrix so when it comes, for instance, to, to uh, studying gene expression, correlation-based distance is often used as the distance measure. It's often used as the distance measure because it considers two objects to be similar if their features are highly correlated. And that's even if their Euclidean distance is far apart. Another way that we can judge similarity is through the use of something called the Levenstein distance. And that measures the similarity between words which is uh, it's really good for allowing us to group text or other non-numeric data. So for instance, we could use this for linguistic synonym clustering. The next thing that we'll need to define is our linkage criterion. And this determines the distance between sets of observations as a function of the pairwise distances between observations. And that sounds really complicated, but in simple terms, the linkage criteria it's just a means of determining whether certain clusters should be merged. And different linkage methods are going to produce different results. So you'll see that the dendrogram will look slightly different depending on the linkage method that you use. The default is often the complete linkage clustering, and that's where we consider the distance between the most distant elements in each cluster. Other commonly used linkage criteria include single linkage and average linkage. So yeah, we use our linkage criteria to update the distance matrix and merge clusters. Some of you might still be a bit confused about how the measure of distance and the linkage criteria work. So I'm going to illustrate this with a more in-depth example. To get a more in-depth view of hierarchical clustering, we're going to focus on an example which uses the agglomerative approach with complete linkage method. Again, we have some pseudo-English here, which is a very simple to-do list for this algorithm. And on the right, we have our pseudocode. And you can see that we have our input, which is our data set, that's denoted by D, and our expected output, which is a dendrogram describing the relationship between our clusters. But yeah, don't worry about reading all of this, um, as I'm now going to go through the algorithm step by step. So it'll start to make much more sense. So the first thing that we want to do is load in our data set. You can see that we have our iris data set shown here with our five data points. So we've got A to E again. And we've got our X and Y. So these are our two features, which are sepal length and petal length. And on the right, we have the scatter plot of these points. So after we load in our iris data set, we can then move on to step two, which involves using some measure of distance to build a distance matrix. So in this case, I've used the default measure, which is the Euclidean distance. And as you can see, I've calculated the distance between each pair of observations. So in a distance matrix, all entries on the main diagonal are going to be zero, um, understandably, because you know, the distance from A to A will be zero, as will the distance from B to B, and so on. And you'll also notice as well that um, the distance matrix is symmetric. So once we have our distance matrix, what we do now is look for the pair of points with the smallest distance. So you can see I've highlighted uh, the smallest distance here in yellow. So the smallest distance is to be found between point A and B. And that makes sense, right? So you can see definitely the smallest distance there. So that will be our first merge. So yeah, we perform that merge of A and B, and we then update our distance matrix. So yeah, remember that the distance matrix is symmetric. So that's why I've not filled it in on uh, this side. And that's just so it's easier to read for you. So we've merged A and B into their own cluster. And now that we've updated our matrix, this is where our complete linkage method comes in, because we need some means of measuring the distance between two clusters in order to perform our next merge. 
To do this, we find the maximum distance between elements of each cluster. So it's just a case of referring to our original distance matrix, which is this one here, to find the right numbers. So let's look at the first clusters. So we have A, B, and C. Here, we simply locate the distance between A and C. So we go back, the distance between A and C is 1.4. And we do the same with B. So the distance between B and C is 2.2. And because we're using the complete linkage method, we pick the maximum of these two distances when we update our distance matrix. So it's obviously going to be the distance, the distance between B and C, which is 2.2. So we enter that in the updated distance matrix. You can see there we've got 2.2. And we then do the same with cluster A, B and D. And we find the maximum distance between these two clusters, which is 4.1. So yeah, we've looked at uh, a compared to D, 3.2, and B compared to D. We found that um, B is furthest away. So we enter 4.1 there. And of course, we do the same for A, B, and E. With the rest of the entries, we're only comparing one element to another. So you know we have C and D, uh, C and E, and E and D. So we simply enter the Euclidean distance, which we computed in the step before. So you can see these numbers are the same. After doing this, we do the same thing. So we look for the smallest distance in the matrix, which as we can see is 1.4. So that's the distance between points D and E. So we perform our second merge and we go on to update our distance matrix, which we'll see on the next slide. So as you can see, we repeat these steps of finding the maximum distance between our clusters and then merging those with the smallest distance until we end up with our result. And because it's agglomerative clustering, you know, we end up basically with all of the points merged into one big cluster. So let's have a look at our results. So this is the output of our agglomerative hierarchical clustering on our data set. We have our measure of cluster distance on the y-axis, and we can see that our first cluster A and B was merged at the height one. And the height of this link is equal to the Euclidean distance between A and B. Whereas the second cluster, D and E, that was merged at 1.4. And again, that's equal to the Euclidean distance between D and E. Then we have A, B and C, which were merged together at the height of 2.2. And finally, we have A, B, C merged with D and E at the height 5.4 which was the result of selecting the maximum distance between A, B, and D, and A, B, and E. So that's where that complete linkage method, method comes in. So the y-axis also shows us how far apart the merged clusters are. The longer the branch, the further apart the merged clusters are. And we can see that the longest branches in uh, this diagram are the two lines that are marked by the blue dashed line labeled two clusters. So you can see, these lines are super long, right? Because these are the longest branches, that indicates that going down from uh, two clusters to one big cluster meant merging some points that are pretty far apart. And you can see that that's the case. When we go back, we can see that, you know, A, B, and C to be merged with D and E, that requires us merging, you know, some parts, uh, some points that were pretty far apart from each other. Let's just uh, quickly go over the strengths of hierarchical, hierarchical clustering. Um, I will just like whiz through these because I'm just a bit conscious of time. Um, so its main strength is that it's easy to understand and it's easy to implement. So what are those four types of clustering algorithms that we discussed? So we had centroid based, distribution based, density based, and finally hierarchical clustering. The math of hierarchical clustering is by far the easiest to understand and program. And its main output, the dendrogram, is also the most appealing to look at in terms of outputs. It gives you this sort of big picture overview and highlights groups in your data. We can also view results at multiple levels of granularity. So you can really like see like the lower levels of clusters, which is quite interesting. Also compared to the k-means algorithm, it's better at uh, hierarchical clustering is really better at generating results when it's dealing with non-convex clusters. And we also have the benefit that, you know, there's no need to specify the number of clusters that you want before you run the algorithm. But of course, there are limitations to this type of clustering as well. 
although it's mathematically very simple, these algorithms are quite computationally expensive. In any of these algorithms, you're going to have to keep calculating the distance between your data points or subclusters, sub and that increases the number of computations that are required. So that's especially true if you're working with a large data set. Another problem that comes when you're working with large data sets is that the results can be hard to visualize. So although, you know, the dendrogram is pretty appealing, it's less so when you've got like, you know, a ton of data. This is a real uh, dendrogram output that I produced as part of a work project. And as you can see, you know, it's, it's pretty gross to look at. Um, but yeah, so, you, you know, not very good with large data sets. That's something to remember. Plus, when you begin, you know, analyzing and making de decisions with dendrograms, what you're going to realize is that hierarchical clustering is heavily driven by heuristics. And that leads to a lot of sort of manual intervention in the process. And consequently, you're going to need some sort of uh, domain specific knowledge to analyze whether the results actually make sense. You know, your objects might be incorrectly grouped at an early stage. So, you know, you're going to have to really examine the results closely to make sure that it makes sense. And also, uh, the algorithm has the disadvantage of not being able to undo any previous steps. So if it clusters two points and later on we see that the connection wasn't a good one, the program's not going to be able to undo that step. So, yeah, this is just a summary slide, which um, I'm not going to go through entirely because I just think it'll eat into our time too much. So you can go back and um, have a look at it and it's just summarizing what are the differences between k-means and hierarchical 